and hello. Welcome to another episode of Pain Nation with Ken McKim. I'm Ken. Thank you so much for joining me this week. Uh, we're coming to you live from uh, Loda TV Studios here. And uh, this week, we're going to talk a little bit more on the uh, therapeutic side of, of the fence, as it were. So some of you may have heard of things called interstitial cystitis, occipital uh, neuralgia, and trigeminal neuralgia. Well, for a lot of people, the extent of the therapy they're able to do is something called nerve blocks when it comes to trigeminal and occipital neuralgia. Now, these are very intense forms of nerve pain that result when uh, the nerves are compressed or otherwise damaged or irritated. And it can be extremely debilitating. Try living uh, a normal life with the, the feeling that you're being stabbed in the face with a fork or electrically shocked at the base of your skull. 90s, there's been a, uh, a form of therapy called uh, occipital stimulation. It's a type of neurostimulation that's aimed at providing therapy for people with these kinds of cranial facial pain issues. Uh, and it's gaining widespread use uh, because it's very customizable therapy. Typically, though, before they actually commit to doing this permanently, you have to go through a trial period where you have uh, temporary electrodes implanted under the, the skin, under the dermal layer, uh, hooked up to a local stimulator, and then they'll go for about a week or so and uh, waiting for feedback for you to say, okay, this works, in which case we can go more permanent or no, we need to try something else. Well, this week's guest is currently undergoing her trial with this uh, occipital nerve stimulation. And she has plenty of experience with interstitial cystitis, trigeminal neuralgia, and occipital neuralgia. She is, in fact, a triple threat, unfortunately, when it comes to having chronic illnesses. I interviewed her just over a year ago on my podcast. Please welcome to the show with me, uh, Mary Hebel. Mary, thank you so much for being here. This Hi, Ken. It's nice to be here. Um... About three years ago, I di got diagnosed with interstitial cystitis, which is a painful bladder condition. I was using the restroom over 40 times a day, um, and it was really getting in the way of my schoolwork. So um, I asked the doctor, I said, I have internships coming up. I really need to do something about this and went to the doctor and got diagnosed. Unfortunately, it was something that um, I couldn't do mental health counseling with that diagnosis. So I started doing patient advocacy efforts and I am in my last two classes to get my master's degree in um, human services with an emphasis on patient advocacy. And then when I finally got that under control, I ended up with a diagnosis of occipital neuralgia after two neck surgeries, you can see my scar, um, I ended up with the diagnosis of trigeminal neuralgia, and it has been a very wild ride since then. You've tried all sorts of different therapies before, I know, for both for interstitial cystitis. I know a lot of that is controlled in many instances by following very strict diets uh, and, a, and some sort of an exercise routine, too, but a lot of it is dietary control. So what have you done before the nerve stimulation to help alleviate the pain with the uh, trigeminal neuralgia? So then I tried every medication, um, gabapentin, um, carbamazepine, which I think is Tegretol. I had um, the nerve blocks where they go into the neck at C2 and 3, and they um, put medicine right on the nerves. And that just was really painful. And then after that, they went in and they froze the nerves. So they stick what looks like a straw through your the back of your neck. And then they put a like a lead in there and they freeze it until like for 90 seconds, I believe, and to try to deaden that nerve. And they did it on both sides. So I had to go back four times one month and that just made everything a lot worse. So um, then he said, you know, I'm not sure what to do with you. I'm very medication sensitive. So he said, I think you need 
a spinal cord stimulator or an occipital nerve stimulator um, and had me scheduled January of 2015 with advanced pain management here in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Um, They called me the day before my appointment, which was planned a month in advance and said that they would not, um, the insurance wouldn't cover it, that it was a coverable expense, but that the insurance wouldn't let them do it because it had to be done by a neurosurgeon in a hospital. So I was very distraught, as you can tell, because or imagine because I was in so much pain that every day was miserable. Um, I ended up contacting a patient advocate at my insurance company, and she um, started the process of helping me find a neurosurgeon. And I went to neurosurgeon after neurosurgeon who told me, yes, you need this, but we don't do them, the pain management doctors do. So January till um, August, I had an appointment in August, and they called me right before and canceled and said, we can offer you an appointment in two years. Um, I think it was because I'm on state assistance and they just filled their quota for the month or the year. Um, So then I started looking again and finally found somebody who would do it in Milwaukee, but my insurance wouldn't cover it. And most insurances won't because it's pretty new. Most of the information that my attorney and I have found um, on the studies are now coming out in 2015, showing how effective they are. So... Um, They said, if you can get it covered, we'll pay for it and we'll take the hit in the money that we won't get. So I started the long process. Um, Insurance said that they would pay for it, but it had to be through in the hospital. And I, I just got conflicting information over and over and over. The insurance company would tell me one thing and then they would tell me another thing. Um, the communication with the doctor, with the um, doctor group, the administration of the group, it was just a mess. Meanwhile, I was having a lot of issues with my heart, um, racing, and finally they put me on pain meds while I started my appeals process. Um, and when I started the appeals process, it took it was just all that one could take out of another. Um, I had to get all my records. I had to do a horrendous amount of work to get that done. And no matter what I did, I would have failed those interviews because the way that the insurance companies said I had to have either chronic regional pain syndrome or filled back surgery. And Obviously, I don't have failed back surgery because my issues are neck and head related. And my pain is uh, along the entire back base of my head. And then my trigeminal neuralgia is mostly under this eye. It feels like it's being gouged out with a grapefruit spoon Um, and my teeth and my jaw. So it's very painful. Um, Once I exhausted exhausted all the skills, then I went to the state of Wisconsin and appealed through them, which has been, which was a long process. Let me, let me just say, okay, a a couple of things really, uh, a couple of things really kind of stand out uh, from what you just told me. One, that treatment that you mentioned where they stick a straw into your neck. Okay. I saw a Dr. Who episode about that. It was it was the way the alien was killing people. That sounds absolutely horrible. I can't imagine what it would be like to have someone stick a straw into my neck. That's that's I can't even believe what that doesn't sound real. <laughs> it doesn't sound like it should be modern medicine. It sounds like uh, old timey witch doctor kind of things. Uh, second of all, I think it was easier for me to buy my house than it has been for you to just get the go ahead to get this treatment that could possibly really improve your quality of life. I, my mind hurts thinking of how much paperwork, how many hoops that you've had to jump through, the fact that you have to have an attorney to get the medical care that you need. 
it's just ridiculous. I, I can't even, I can't even can. <laughs> it just, it hurts my brain. I, I don't even know. You have to be commended, one, for your stick to through all of this, because obviously you're in great pain while you're trying to get this taken care of. And two, you're, you're finishing school at the same time. It's crazy. I mean, how do you, how do you do it? I mean, this has got to be a very wearing process. I, I imagine that your, your moods must go up and down. How do you stave off permanent depression going through all of this? I have a really good counselor. I had a really good psychologist when I ended up with IC who then helped me with my neuralgia issues. So that helped. Breathing exercises helps. The, the neuralgia that you're dealing with. And yet somehow through all the pain, you decided that you were going to do your part to try to support other people who had similar conditions to yours. So when we spoke about a year ago, you had formed the IC Strong Group that was primarily just dealing with interstitial cystitis, earth on different treatments that have worked for them, share uh, inspiring little tidbits here and there. And then since then though, you've added quite a number of other IC related support pages. Would you tell everybody about those and, and what inspired you to, to kind of expand out? Many of them are still small because the process to get my trial stimulator was I applied January 27th and my decision wasn't until the end of May that he said, yes, the state had to pay for my trial. Um, so we have IC Strong for interstitial cystitis, one for men with interstitial cystitis. I have one for chronic pain. Um, one for depression and anxiety with chronic illness because chronic anxiety and depression with chronic illness is a little different than um, regular anxiety and depression. And then I do have one for occipital and trigeminal neuralgia. Um, I try to stay active on Twitter, but it's just been the process of getting my trial approved was so intense. I actually had to step away from a lot of my groups and let my admins run it. So hopefully soon we'll be getting the blogs. Um, we have IC Strong, Pinterest, Instagram, and Twitter. So hopefully we'll be getting more things up um, and running as soon as I can get my permanent one. I had the trial um, spinal cord stimulator on my birthday, June 22nd. It was horribly painful and not what I expected. I thought they were going to put it in the back of my head and run it up and over, but they ended up putting it in my thoracic spine and just running it up to the base of my head. I did get pneumonia, so I had to have it removed right pretty much two days after I had it put in, but it was amazing. No nausea, no blood pressure problems. My pain was completely gone. You asked how I got through this whole process. And I have to say my support group members and the friendships that I've made, my friends off the support group, my family, everybody has just been so supportive. And I just saw a graphic that said, um, I don't have trigeminal neuralgia, my family does, which is true. I do have a very good primary care doctor who's an integrative medicine doctor, and she's very in tune to helping me um, with my pain control. So that's one thing a lot of people just don't get. So I'm very, very blessed and lucky. And I was very blessed to have an attorney that um, who took on my case with the Disability Rights Wisconsin. And he was a superstar, uh, just a superstar. He worked so hard on my case. So, And then he gave me everything and said, here you go. You can represent everybody else. And there are estimated 200 people in the state of Wisconsin alone who need this procedure and can't get it. So uh, how long do you have before you can move from the trial to something more permanent? Because as, as you describe it, it seems to have been a great success, although that's not the birthday present 
anybody would choose for themselves normally, but it seems to have been working very well for you. So uh, about how much longer do you think you'll be on the trial versus getting a more permanent implant? The trial is out. And actually, my birth, my I picked my birthday because I thought, what an amazing birthday present after two years of being in pain to be pain free. And let me tell you, it was the most amazing thing once you get past the surgical incision point. Um, the, so the trial was only in two days, so I don't have it anymore. So obviously I'm on my pain meds and other medications. Um, and there's currently issues in knowing when the permanent one will be placed, um, issues with the doctor's office and the insurance company, and I'm not exactly sure what they are or what when I'll get it. It could be a couple weeks, it could be a couple months. We're not exactly sure at this point. So you found something that works, and it worked very well, and now you're back to waiting through more red tape, more bureaucratic nonsense. That's got to be frustrating. I would be, I would be angry. I know I would be. I know me, and that would just make me furious. And and yet you're so calm. Every time I I talk to you and I see you online and everything, you have the biggest smile. All your pictures, you're smiling. You are so amazingly positive, and I. I don't know how you do it. I know you said that you have quite the support system, but some of that at your core has to come from inside you. There's only so much that other people can do for you. So I have to commend you for being made of some very strong stuff <laughs> to, to just keep pushing on and all this. Now, that brings me to another question I have for you. You have all these support groups now on, on Facebook with the IC uh, labeling on it. Do you have a lot of caregivers uh, that also participate, uh, that come into the, the chats and, and, and share information and stories too? Or is it typically just more people who are personally affected by these issues? Um, for the interstitial cystitis, the support group that we have is just for the people who have um, IC. We do have a public page that... Allie Rubin, shout out to my admin, Allie Rubin, um, posts a lot of informative articles, and that is for people with interstitial cystitis, as well as their caregivers, their spouses, their family, their coworkers, et cetera, to learn about it. I'm hoping to open something up for chronic pain that's like that eventually, um, but I have to get through this hurdle first, obviously, and graduate. Um, there are so many things that I want to do to set up. And um, I have great admin staff that helps me with all of my groups. In fact, on my support group for trigeminal and occipital neuralgia, I had two of the members give me letters for the judge and they were very influential in his decision on getting me the trial and and telling the insurance company they had to pay for it so and as far as being positive i'm not always positive and i did curl my hair and do my makeup it took me two hours but i did it it doesn't happen often it's usually a ponytail and barely any makeup but I do have my dark days. There were many days this last um, winter and fall or spring where and fall where I just wish God would bring up my number because not that I would do anything to myself, but just let me out of the pain. It was so intense. I've cried. I cry. I laugh. I And yes, last Friday when I found out that the the there was a holdup in getting my pre-authorization to the insurance company or whatever the issue is. I don't even know where the issue is. Um, I cried because I was angry and I was frustrated and I thought, man, I fought for eight months just in the fighting process, not just finding a surgeon to do it, but the whole process and waiting 
waiting, waiting. It was a, a lot of do this and then wait. And it's hard. I won't lie. It's hard. It's been a hard life. My last two years, I'm going on two years exactly of having occipital neuralgia. And I want to tell all the healthy people out there who do things all the time, cherish that, love that, because mine was taken away literally in a heartbeat. I was walking into a store and it was like somebody walked up and hit me in the back of the head with a two by four. And um, it's kind of been downhill since then. And trigeminal neuralgia is considered a rare disorder. So there's not a lot of money for research. There's not a lot of research even being done. Um, and I know that there's this huge opioid um, issue. And actually, the insurance company's lawyer said in his closing statements, why can't she just stay on fentanyl the rest of her life? And I'm like, really? I thought we wanted this off the street. There's something that they can give me. I do have a stimulator for my bladder, and it works amazing. So I do have a spinal cord stimulator already, and so I knew kind of what to expect on this one. And I'm excited to get it, graduate, get my MS in human services, and just go out and change some laws so more people can get theirs, um, do some more active ad advocacy efforts for everybody suffering with chronic pain. Um, and eventually I'd like to find a way to start an organization so that nobody with chronic illness, no matter what it is, has to go to the doctor alone. There should be patient advocates everywhere, kind of like sexual assault advocates that you can call in and have come with you to bridge that gap between the doctor and the, the patient. So I have a lot of things in the works. I want to write a book and a lot of things. I just have to get through school first. So. Well, no, you brought up a very good point. You've, you've got to be your own advocate, but if you can do that for someone else, that's a very valuable service. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people, as you pointed out, that don't have access to that. They don't have family that's invested in, in helping them through the, the harder uh, pathways to navigate in this medical bureaucracy that we have. I know that I had to make it a point to go to all my wife's doctor's appointments because she has Crohn's and and you you can't be afraid to fire your doctor. We learned that fairly quickly. We, we had to go through a couple of them before we found one that was a very good fit uh, for my wife and who wanted to be an active partner in her health care. And I feel for people who don't have someone who can do that. And so to hear you talk about uh, putting together something that will increase the number of advocates that are available for people who might not have any other options, that is, that's a very noble goal and that's very exciting to hear. Uh, I wish more people would, would consider doing that, but it's a tough racket. A lot of doctors don't want another person in that examination room. <laughs> I mean, that's just, they, they, uh, they don't feel very comfortable with that, but uh, you just gotta be uh, persistent when it, when it comes to being your own advocate and, and fighting for your own health care. As far as how to navigate through the healthcare industry, uh, how to find help out there, what would you suggest? Every insurance company has advocates or omnids, but um, I can't even say it. But there's somebody who can help you. Um, don't be afraid to go above that doctor's head. I had a neurologist who said I was drug seeking. And I'm like, you diagnosed me with the most painful disorder known to man. And... Um, that is considered the suicide disorder, yet you're saying I'm drug seeking because I'm hurting and I'm asking for pain relief. Um, and I did go up all the way to the top of that provider network before I switched networks. Um, so don't be afraid to go above your doctor's head and to say, is there somebody else I can see? Um, I'm available. You can give them my link, um, 
if you look at for IC Strong, I'm at IC Strong on Twitter and um, I'm very active on my personal page, but we have several groups. Just look for, I don't know if you can read it, but hashtag I see strong. We also have a clothing line, so that's pretty cool. Um, but don't be afraid to go through the appeals process. Appeal the decision. If they say no, don't accept that because I didn't. And while it was a year and a half journey, um, I was precedent. Not one person has ever gone as far as I did. And I can see why, because it was hard. But take advantage of all the appeals process. Um, a great resource for everybody who is struggling is the Aging and Disability Resource Center in your area. They can represent you with disability paperwork. They can help you in administrative law hearings. They do have a very wide range of things that can help you. So that's my suggestion, but I'm available to help anybody who wants to contact me as well. We will definitely, uh, after this is over, I will go ahead and make sure that I've got links to all your different uh, support pages uh, on the event page so that people can reach out to you through there. And again, we're, we're, I'm so happy that you made time to do this. I know how busy you are and you've definitely got your plate full. But thank you for coming on, for talking about this with everybody. And uh, well, I'm, I'm sure I'll see you around online. But again, thank you, Mary. I appreciate it so much. It's nice right. seeing you. Bye, everyone. All right, so that'll wrap up one more edition of Pain Nation with Ken McKim. Thank you so much for being here today. Remember, if you have questions, you can always send them to me, ken at don'tpunishpain.com. You can also follow me over on Twitter at Don't Punish Pain. As always, until next time, I'm Ken McKim. You take care.